Chapter 5, Busting the Myths About Libertarianism Statists are very quick to dismiss libertarianism, but few statists, if any, spend much time studying libertarian ideas in depth. It seems odd that even when presented with the opportunity to take a fresh look at the question of the state versus the individual, a statist wouldn't first explore libertarian ideas before reaching a definitive conclusion. It's almost as if the statist is afraid of what he might discover. Due to their lack of substantive knowledge about libertarianism, statists subscribe to a number of myths about this political philosophy. There's a very rich body of intellectual work underlying the libertarian philosophy, which answers all of the usual questions statists pose, but which, sadly, is mostly unexplored by statists. A small subset of this work is listed in the reading guide at the end of this book. This section is not intended to be a treatise on how a libertarian world might operate. That could be the subject of an entire book in and of itself. Instead, this section is merely intended to try to address some of the most common myths about libertarianism and to whet the appetite of the intellectually curious reader. What is libertarianism? For the human species to survive and flourish, man must use his body to work the earth's physical resources to transform these resources into products that satisfy human needs. However, people and physical resources are scarce relative to needs, and thus conflicts necessarily arise as to the control of these human bodies and physical resources. In fact, it is more basic than that. The only reason that conflicts arise in society is due to disputes over who has the right to control physical property, i.e. human bodies and physical objects. This is because one person's control of physical property necessarily excludes another's. For instance, either I can stand in this physical space or somebody else can, but we both can't. Either I can decide what to put in my body or someone else can decide for me, but we both can't. Either I can control this widget or someone else can, but we both can't. Given that these disputes arise in all societies, political philosophy is essentially the search for a set of principles to determine who, in such disputes, has the better right to the physical property in question. These principles are known as property rights, and, if generally adhered to, can minimize conflict by heading off disputes in advance. Different political philosophies claim to have different property right regimes. To the socialist, conceptually, the people, as one mass, own all physical property. However, when it comes to actually making decisions about what can be done with this property, a much smaller group gets to make these decisions, the ruling elite. And thus, in fact, the ruling elite exercises all the powers normally attached to ownership. The rest of the people are forcibly prohibited from challenging the ruling elite's decisions. To the theocrat, conceptually, either the deity owns all physical property, or individuals can own property, but subject to divine constraints. However, when it comes to actually making decisions about what can be done with this property, a much smaller group gets to interpret the deity's desires, the priesthood, and thus, in fact, the priesthood exercises all powers normally attached to ownership. The rest of the people are forcibly prohibited from challenging the priesthood's decisions. To the Democrat, conceptually, individuals can own their own bodies and other physical property. However, when it comes to actually making decisions about what can be done with bodies and other physical property, a much smaller group gets to make these decisions, the elected class and their appointed agents, through legislation, and thus, in fact, the elected class exercises all the powers normally attached to ownership. The rest of the people are forcibly prohibited from challenging the elected class's decision. If the description of democracy sounds like a duplication of the descriptions of how socialism and theocracy work, then that's because it is. In a democracy, the political class, meaning the combined executive, legislative, judiciary, and bureaucracy, can tell a person, A, what he is entitled to or must do with his body, 
e.g. to where he can travel, what he can put in his body, what work or leisure activities he can perform with his body, with whom he must work or otherwise associate, what he can say, what he can read, who he must or can kill, etc. And b. What he is entitled to do with his property, e.g. what he can keep from what he earns, what he can buy, and at what price, how he can use what he is allowed to keep or buy, to whom he can sell it, and at what price, etc. The only material philosophical difference between socialism, theocracy, and democracy is how the rulers are chosen. In socialism and modern theocracies, it has most often been through violent revolution. In the case of democracy, it has been through a subset of the population voting. However, the voting process in a democracy doesn't change the fact that no one who objects to the ruler's decisions about property usage may opt out and do with his body and property as he pleases. The libertarian property rights regime, however, is quite different from every other political philosophy. It is this. No one may initiate aggression or threaten the same against another's body or legitimate property. This is known as the non-aggression principle, or NAP. Consistent with the NAP, legitimate title to non-human property can be acquired only in one of three ways. A. By a person physically working previously on owned property using peacefully obtained means, so as to objectively evidence the earliest direct control, homesteading, b. through a voluntary transfer agreement entered into by one person with another who legitimately owns the property, contracting, or c. by one person seizing the legitimately owned property of another who has initiated a violent act against the first person, restitution. In none of these ways does the new owner initiate aggression against another to acquire the property. In the case of homesteading, no one yet owns the property, so there is no one from whom to take it with aggression. In the case of contracting, the current owner is voluntarily agreeing to transfer ownership, and in the case of restitution, the current owner, through his initial commission of a violent act, is estopped, prohibited from objecting to the seizure of his property, on the grounds that he who initiates aggression cannot then complain about retaliatory force being directed back at him by the victim. While the contracting and restitution principles probably don't require much more explanation, the homesteading principle might. The first thing to note about the homesteading principle is that it is based on the idea that everyone has the best claim to his own body. If a person has the best claim to his own body, then he must surely have the best claim to anything his body physically and peacefully produces, leaving aside any voluntary agreement that he enters into to the contrary. Thus, if a person works previously unowned property, then he must have the best claim to the product of that work. It would be very hard to argue that someone else has a better claim to this product, for this would imply that this other person somehow has a superior claim to the first person's body. And if every man has a superior claim to every other man's body, then there is the problem of circularity. A controls B's body, and yet B controls A's body, and it would mean that no man could ever act without getting everyone else's consent, which would be impossible to obtain. Mankind would not survive. The second thing to note about the homesteading principle is that it invalidates the notion that individuals at the state can claim previously unowned property as public property. A mere verbal claim of ownership is insufficient. The person claiming to have homesteaded unowned property must have applied material physical effort to the property and made it obvious to others that he is in control, e.g. by constructing a fence around virgin land by putting apples picked in the wild into his basket, etc. A mere verbal claim fails to meet the previously mentioned objective of establishing a property rights regime which minimizes conflict. If all that were necessary is a verbal claim, which only requires a trivial effort by the claimant, then everyone could allege that they made the first verbal claim, and they could allege that their claim related to all unknown property on the face of the earth. That would increase conflict. 
not minimize it. In addition, since homesteading is intended to be a peaceful means of property acquisition, the person claiming to have homesteaded property must not have used violently obtained means, for then all the things that he does with such means would be tainted. Thus, if the state were to use forced labor, e.g. prisoners, conscripted draftees, etc., to apply effort to and delineate borders around some unknown property, or to use taxes to purchase the requisite labor services and bordering material, then this would not qualify as homesteading because the labor and or taxes were coercively obtained. The third thing to understand about homesteading is to consider the consequences of what it would mean to reject this principle. If the first person to work some unknown property is not to be regarded as the permanent owner, assuming he doesn't voluntarily transfer it to someone else or have it seized in a restitution procedure, then who should be so regarded? There are only three other possibilities. First, everyone in the world owns such property in common, and thus everyone's consent would be required before anything could be done with it. However, in this case, how could any decisions ever be made about what to do with this property? It would be effectively rendered useless. Mankind would cease to exist if no decisions could be made about how to use property. Second, the property remains unowned despite the act of homesteading, i.e. no one could ever own property. If this were the case, then the effect would be that either all property would be rendered useless or there would be perpetual conflict over property which could never be peacefully resolved. Third, some other person who later acts on the property is to be regarded as the owner, a latecomer. However, if this were the case, then ownership could only ever be temporary. A person who owns some property at any point in time would have to live with the perpetual fear that a latecomer might come along and seize the property, and it's not clear how a latecomer could legitimately seize the property from the current owner. This would reduce the current owner's incentives to apply more resources to the property, i.e. to invest in improving it, as he would be liable to lose control over it at any time and it would truly be survival of the strongest. Imagine the state of an apartment which has no permanent landlord and is liable to be taken over by a new tenant at any time. Mankind certainly wouldn't flourish anywhere near its maximum potential if everyone viewed property in this way. There is not much more to libertarianism than the above principles, but the libertarian insists that they be applied consistently to every single human being on the grounds that all men are metaphysically equal. So there is no cogent justification for some men being entitled to live by a different behavioral code. Thus, based on the NAP, the libertarian rejects the notions that a. Someone can force another person to do with his body as the first person requires, which is what the individuals at the state do when they regulate people's actions, conscript them for war, and require them to serve on juries. B. Someone can take or control another person's existing property without his voluntary agreement or a proper restitution procedure, which is what the individuals at the state do when they tax, seize, and regulate people's property. And C. The individuals at the state can legitimately claim ownership of previously unowned land, water, air, and natural resources lying beneath the surface since these are claims made over unowned property using other resources which were illegitimately acquired. To anticipate a statist objection, when the libertarian states that people should be able to use their body and property as they see fit, this does not mean that they may use them to initiate murder, rape, kidnap, or assault, or theft or destruction of another's property. Those actions would themselves be a breach of the NAP and thus would be illegitimate in a libertarian society. However, the corollary to this, that those at the state may also not initiate these actions, which therefore rules out taxation, regulation, conscription, involuntary incarceration for nonviolent crimes, etc. To anticipate another statist objection, the NAP only proscribes the initiation of aggressive actions but does not proscribe responding with such action in appropriate circumstances.
Thus, A may legitimately use force against B in self-defense, provided B initiated the violence, and C may legitimately seize D's property as restitution or retribution for D having initiated aggression against C or his property. The libertarian objection to the traditional actions of individuals at the state is that through taxation, regulation, and enforcement, they initiate the taking of the property and or the incarceration of others when these others have not themselves breached the NAP. Libertarianism, then, is simply a philosophy about when actual or threatened violence is acceptable. However, libertarians recognize actual or threatened violence in all areas of society rather than giving a pass to those at the state, i.e., Libertarianism is a universal standard, not a selective one. But beyond this, libertarianism does not prescribe any particular behavioral norms for mankind. These norms are left to be defined by one's culture, ethnicity, regional customs, family traditions, religion, trade, education, etc. Accordingly, the NAP is only a minimum and not a comprehensive behavioral standard. Put another way, libertarianism is a philosophy which minimizes aggression while maximizing personal freedom. What's not to like about that? Myth 14. Libertarians are utopian. Statists like to claim that libertarians are utopian and that libertarianism is unworkable. It's worth exploring these concepts a little further. The kids get it. Statists reliably teach their young children two basic rules governing interaction with other children, and these rules neatly sum up libertarianism. Don't hit the other kids, and don't take their stuff. Yet when the statist child is old enough to learn about politics, the statist turns his philosophy around 180 degrees and tells his child that, provided you can get enough people to support you, i.e. get elected, you are free to effectively hit or threaten to hit others and to take their stuff. Thus, by their own characterization, statists start out as utopian teachers to their children. If they only stopped there. Exactly who is utopian? A commonly accepted definition of utopia is a place of ideal, although unattainable, perfection, especially in laws, government, and social conditions. Consider, however, what the statist believes. A. That individuals at the state who have an awesome monopoly on coercion in a region will only act selflessly and will impose limits on themselves. B. That, as a result, limited government is possible, even though in the history of the nation-state all that has ever happened is that the state has grown enormously. C that there are some individuals who are so omniscient as to be able to discern a common good for millions of other people and to efficiently manage the flow of society's resources to attain that end. D. Accordingly, with respect to any particular economy, that relying on a coercively imposed central planning monopoly is more likely to maximize individual consumers' satisfaction than decentralized competition, and e, that use of centrally directed force as the first tool to resolve societal conflicts is likely to lead to a more peaceful society. On the other hand, libertarians accept human foibles for what they are, and believe that these foibles are inherent in everyone, without exception and thus look to mitigate the impact of these foibles by objecting to the centralization of coercive power in any individuals. The libertarian recognizes that there is no common good among millions of different people, or if there is, no human could discern it, but that each individual has his own preferences, and that since no man could produce sufficient goods to satisfy all of his preferences, he must trade with others to obtain what he cannot produce for himself. In a truly voluntary society, the norm would be that to obtain something you want, you first have to produce something someone else wants 
and then engage in an exchange which, by definition, means that there would be mutual gain. This is not a fantasy. Although we live in a statist world, millions of these exchanges occur daily. Accordingly, everyone who is compliant would be looking to peacefully please others as the route to their own happiness, as opposed to being able to forcefully impose their needs on others, which is what the state allows people to do. Those who are not compliant and who initiate aggression could still be restrained or excluded by force. To think about these differences in another way, consider goals. The statist has very lofty goals for which he wishes to employ the state, such as equality, save the planet, no discrimination, free or low-cost health care, housing, and education for all, spread democracy, etc. To attain these goals, if any of them are actually attainable, requires complex interactions among millions of humans in specific sequences and at specific places and times. No one brain or group of brains is able to comprehend, never mind plan and implement, the actions that need to take place. On the other hand, the libertarian goal is entirely within the control of each individual. Don't hit anyone or take their stuff. Now, exactly who is utopian? The statist never really compares the state as it actually works against the few glimpses of the free market that we could find in the real world, presumably because the evidence is so dauntingly adverse to his position. For instance, what serves consumers better, our state-controlled military, health care insurance, financial and educational systems, or the private sector, iPhone and bread supply system? Instead, the statist imagines that the individuals at the state have superhuman powers to achieve the statist ambitious, but wholly unrealistic, central planning objectives, and compares this to the imperfection of the decentralized free market, which is operated by mere humans. This is not utopian thinking. The libertarian, rather than expecting utopia, simply believes that the NAP is the most just governance principle because it allows, although by no means eradicates, the initiation of force and thus violent conflict. In contrast, the statist believes that the most just way to run society is to institutionalize violent conflict by empowering those individuals at the state to initiate or threaten force. Only negative rights, duties, are workable. Moral philosophy deals principally with the search for just principles of interaction among humans. Three minimum requirements for a just system are that the principles A are technically feasible, B are universal, and C promote human survival. The first requirement hopefully is self-evidence. It makes no sense to argue for principles that cannot work in the real world. The second requirement simply recognizes that all men are metaphysically equal, and thus no man has any natural entitlement to special treatment for better or worse. The third requirement recognizes that the other two are not sufficient if we are trying to sustain humanity and human interaction. If we're not, then it is pointless to try to reason out a moral philosophy. For instance, a philosophy that advocates all men commit suicide would be workable and universal, but hardly achieves much in the way of sustaining humanity. So, how do libertarianism and statism measure up as moral philosophies? Libertarianism's central principle is non-aggression, which is a negative right. As such, it is a behavioral standard that, as a technical matter, can be universally applied, meaning that it is technically possible for every man to live by this standard concurrently with every other man. This is because the NAP simply outlines what one cannot do to his fellow man, namely initiate interference with his body or property. There cannot be any conflict among men if everyone's negative rights are respected. Everyone could live with and profit from the non-initiation of force at the same time 
However, as noted earlier, but it bears repeating, the NAP is a minimum as opposed to a comprehensive behavioral code. Thus, the libertarian philosophy provides a workable universal standard, and as noted above, it also inherently discourages, outlaws, violent conflict, and hence promotes human survival. In contrast with libertarianism, the statist's philosophy has many positive rights embedded in it, meaning that it prescribes what one man can take from another's property or require of another's body through taxes and regulations backed by the threat of force. The reliance on positive rights backed by the initiation of force means that statism cannot provide a workable universal standard that promotes human survival. First, one man's positive rights necessarily conflict with another man's negative and positive rights. As to the positive-negative rights conflict, the person who is forced by another to give up something he owns or do something with his body has his negative right to be left alone violated. So the status must necessarily argue that some men don't have these negative rights. But why and how are these men to be identified? As to the positive-positive rights conflict, given scarcity, positive rights cannot be universally applied to and enjoyed by every man concurrently, as not everyone could enjoy the right to the same physical object at the same time. In fact, only one man could use any physical object at a time, so who gets to choose who prevails? Second, if the statist argues that his philosophy involves a universal principle, then he would have to argue that every man has the right to use force to take what he wants. Does that really make sense as a behavioral standard to promote human survival? Accordingly, whereas the NAP is technically feasible, universalizable, and designed to discourage conflict, statism's use of force principle is either not universal if it implies that only some men are entitled to initiate force, or is an all-against-all principle that can only lead to ultimate societal degradation. Hence, I would argue that it is statism, as opposed to libertarianism, that is not a workable moral philosophy. To the extent that the statist is aware of the NAP, he often misunderstands its implication. One major criticism levied by statists is the believing in the nap is nice, but it's just like saying, do the right thing. Namely, it's apt to regularly fail, since some people would still act aggressively. However, the purpose of the nap is not to eradicate aggression, although the more people who subscribe to the nap, the less aggression there would be, but rather to allocate liability based on this principle. Libertarians fully recognize that there will always be aggression and disputes, but suggest that the NAP be the guiding principle in resolving these disputes. Myth number 15. It's every man for himself. This is a favorite among statists. They envision the libertarian as a rugged individualist, perhaps a survivalist, who wants to live off the grid, on his own island, barely interacting with others. This only shows how poorly statists understand libertarianism, society, and basic economics. There's more to society than the state. In between the individual and the state, there are many voluntary forms of association. There are families, neighborhoods, businesses, marketplaces, religious groups, common interest associations, e.g. athletic groups, artistic groups, musical groups, etc., charities, mutual aid societies, etc. All of these groups allow humans to voluntarily interact with each other to serve their needs. Since they are voluntarily formed groups, interactions only occur because the respective parties believe that they will each benefit. All of these forms of association and their related human interaction would continue to exist in a libertarian world only the state would cease to exist. Statists wrongly perceive the libertarian as being for only one thing, namely himself. In fact, the libertarian is not for any one thing, rather he is against only one thing, 
namely the initiation or threat of force, whether by an individual aggressor or the state. Only individuals have rights. Statists misinterpret the libertarian focus on individual rights. This does not mean that libertarians are against groups. Rather, it simply means that, to the libertarian, rights are defined at the individual level. Only individuals can have rights and be wronged. While the libertarian advocates for every individual to have the right not to be coerced, he is not arguing in any sense against the existence of or participation in broader societal groups, if voluntarily formed. In contrast, the statist is category-focused. He puts each individual into one or more categories, e.g. blacks, women, workers, the wealthy, immigrants, etc., regards each individual in a category as being identical to every other when it comes to advocating for state policies and believes that rights are group rights. Libertarians regard each individual as unique and irreplaceable. Thus, the libertarian is the champion of each individual as his own sovereign being and not just some member of a category. Not isolationist. The libertarian is a staunch advocate for free trade between individuals, which contradicts the notion that libertarians are isolationist. As discussed earlier, no man could produce for himself all that he needs, and any man would be foolish to try to do so, since every man can profit from specializing in what he does relatively better and trading with other men who do other things relatively better. The concept, the division of labor, has been one of the greatest boons to global wealth creation over the past few centuries and is partially responsible for moving man out of a subsistence existence to where he is today. The libertarian recognizes this, and his individual rights principles do not in any way reduce his appetite for specialization and trade. All libertarianism demands is that specialization in trade be voluntary, not coerced. Only individuals can act. The statist assumes that his preferred form of collectivism is superior to the so-called individualism that he sees within libertarianism without really thinking too hard about what collectivism means. A group cannot think or act. Only individuals can think and act. Thus, even within collectivism, some individual has to make and implement a final decision. That individual, as a human being, would bring to that decision and its implementation his personal biases, incompetence, and ideology. Under statism, the ruling individual's personal biases, incompetence, and ideology would, through his enactment or enforcement of legislation or execution of foreign policy, be coercively imposed on everyone under his rule, whether they want to have any interaction with this person or not. In contrast, in a libertarian society, no individual's personal biases, incompetence, or ideology would be imposed on anyone except for those who voluntarily choose to interact with that individual, assuming, of course, that such individual is not violating the NAP. In other words, statism is really just one person's individualism forcibly imposed on others. Myth 16 Libertarianism equals chaos. Statists assume that the absence of government in a libertarian society means an absence of governance, and thus that libertarianism implies social chaos. Nothing could be further from the truth. The market could provide law and security. Libertarianism assumes that there would be conflicts that would need to be resolved requiring adjudication tribunals using developed bodies of law, similar to how today's courts function. Libertarianism also assumes that there would be aggression, both from individuals and, if they exist, states, thus requiring protective services, similar to today's police and military forces. The principled way in which libertarianism differs from statism in the areas of law and security is that libertarianism implies that policing, 
courts, and defense would, like all other services, be provided by competitive suppliers who would only earn revenues from customers who have freely entered into contracts with them. Accordingly, these service providers would have to provide ongoing value and innovation to keep their customers. Contrast this with statism. Where these types of services are generally provided by a state monopoly, which means compelled revenues in the form of taxation, likely increasing over time, and ever lower service levels. Libertarianism also assumes that bodies of law would be developed locally from the ground up through adjudication of actual disputes, as was the case historically before states forcibly assumed legislative power, as discussed earlier. Contrast this with the arbitrary top-down statist legislation of today that applies to all citizens prospectively, even those not involved in any dispute. The statist argument in the area of law and security is essentially the public goods argument, namely that if we don't have a state monopoly providing these services, then these services wouldn't be provided at all, or else only in insufficient amounts. Earlier, I detailed the problems with the public goods argument in the historical, moral, and economic perspectives, and so will not do so again here. However, the statist argument also fails because it does not acknowledge that history shows, quite convincingly, that if there is demand for a product, then individuals will rise to the occasion and develop the product without the state's involvement. Sometimes as entrepreneurs, other times as end users. Simply because the statist sitting in his living room can't envision how this would unfold doesn't mean that it wouldn't get done. It just means that the statist is clearly not going to be the person who develops the solution. No one ever sat down and centrally mapped out how money or language might develop. There was a need for these two concepts, and so individuals engaged in trial and error until they found the optimal solutions, at least until money was forcibly taken over and debased by the state for its own ends. The statist cannot explain, logically, why the default should always be a coercive monopoly provider simply because he cannot conceive of how something might develop differently. It is beyond the scope of this book to go into detail about how law and security services might be provided in a libertarian society. No one could say for sure, just as no one could have predicted in advance how things such as today's communications technologies or variety of breakfast cereals would develop. Indeed, if it were possible to specify exactly how things would be configured in the future, then that would be the best argument for statism, as then central planning might work. There is, however, a very rich body of intellectual work that exists in this area to provide some guiding thoughts based on historical and current examples and compelling logic. Drawing on this material below, I will provide a glimpse of what a libertarian law and order system might look like. I will discuss national defense separately later. Self-defense. The first thing to note relates to self-protection. To minimize resistance to the state's edicts, states typically seek to disarm their citizens through gun control legislation. The alleged deal imposed coercively by the state is that citizens give up their right to arm themselves in return for the state's protection from violent crime. Yet, when the state's police cannot realistically be at the scene of every, or perhaps any, violent crime while it is actually occurring, of what value is this deal? In a libertarian world, there would be no restrictions on firearm ownership, which would significantly increase each citizen's self-defense options. Of course, there would be liability, as there is today, for misusing firearms to initiate aggression against others. Policing. Beyond enhanced self-protection, in a libertarian world, instead of being forced to pay taxes to the state to fund a one-size-fits-all police force, individuals would choose among different protection services firms and voluntarily pay them for their services. 
these service providers would compete on price and service and would offer a menu of different options. Unlike the state's police, those providers that failed to serve actual customer demand would go out of business and those that meet demand would make profits. There might be firms that specialize in residential premises protection and others that specialize in commercial premises protection. Some might emphasize feet on the street, preventative community policing. Others might prefer the technology-based approach to surveillance and, still others, might provide undercover policing. Some might arm their personnel with firearms, others merely with less lethal means. Some might focus on hiring certain ethnic types to provide ethnic group-oriented services in the appropriate neighborhoods. Unlike the state's police, security firms would have no special immunity for their actions. Those firms that act with excessive violence when performing their services would lose customers who do not support this type of policing, and as word gets around, they might not be able to attract new customers. They might also face lawsuits from those against whom they act with excessive violence. If they lose these lawsuits, then payment of the judgments would increase their operating costs. Such companies might then try to pass these higher costs on to their customers in the form of higher prices or reduced services. However, this would cause these firms to lose customers to competitors which have lower operating costs because they're less violent and thus could offer better pricing and or service options. Criminal justice. Crime would no longer be something for which the state takes action. It would exclusively be a matter between the victim and the aggressor, and victims would be able to take action against aggressors without being stymied by state intervention. The definition of crime would be limited to initiating aggression against another person's body or legitimate property i.e. there would be no victimless crimes arbitrarily created by state regulation. Thus, the law would once again become comprehensible to everyone and policing by security firms would be more focused and thus more efficient. These firms would only be concerned with protecting against or investigating actual violent acts against person or property. Instead of the state's approach to punishment, which tends to be focused on deterrence and rehabilitation, although the state system is woeful at achieving even these objectives, different punishment systems would arise in different communities based on what is acceptable in those communities. It is likely that these systems may all be based on restitution, but some might also provide for retribution. Victims who, for ethical or practical reasons, don't want to exact the maximum acceptable punishment on their aggressors, could agree with the aggressors on lesser punishments on a customized basis. A victim who exacted more than an acceptable punishment on an aggressor would himself be liable to be sued by the aggressor for unjustified violence, which would, therefore, place limits on how aggressively victims act. Adjudication of Disputes Disputes would be adjudicated by private mediation and arbitration firms. Different firms would offer different types of dispute resolution procedures, with some specializing in different subject matters, and others specializing by geography, religion, culture, or other factors. Those judges who develop a reputation for fairness and subject matter competence would garner more business and those who develop a reputation for undue bias and or incompetence would lose business. Different groups, such as Catholics, Orthodox Jews, Quakers, those against capital punishment, etc., might prefer to use their own forums to adjudicate intra-group disputes so that they could ensure that their own customs are taken into account. For intergroup disputes, the parties would have to agree on an independent adjudicator and when successful, independent adjudicators render judgments acceptable to both groups. This would cause the different groups' legal norms to converge. Enforcement If a victim couldn't or didn't want to pursue an aggressor himself, then he might be able to retain an enforcement company to do this for him 
or even sell his company his right to punish the aggressor. Perhaps the enforcement company would be entitled to a fee based on the speed of solving the crime and or the amount of compensation it recovers for the victim from the aggressor. Therefore, unlike today's police, such a company would be aligned with the victim's interests and would be highly motivated to solve the crime, pursue the aggressor, and exact the punishment. Yet, unlike today's police, this enforcement company would have no special immunity. Accordingly, if this company employed excessive violence in its activities, then it could face lawsuits from the original aggressors and thus potentially incur higher operating costs as well as develop a bad reputation, all of which could spell trouble for its business model. If an aggressor developed a bad reputation by a. being a repeat offender, b. not submitting to dispute resolution procedures, or c. not complying with judgments against him, then, depending on societal norms, he would risk being subject to force and or being ostracized by his personal and or business community, and he could be excluded from local trade or employment, or since all property would be privately owned, by the owners of local roads, stores, schools, etc. Companies might arise which specialize in tracking such aggressors, creating easily accessible reputation reports, like today's credit reports, these reports would be used by the community to deny such aggressors access to all sorts of private property, employment, or trade. Thus, rather than forcibly remove these aggressors to the brutal confines of today's state prisons, the community's punishment might be widespread physical exclusion. Detention for those aggressors who are sufficiently ostracized and thus have nowhere else to go, detention companies might arise which offer room, board, and employment, provided these aggressors agree to certain behavior guidelines and supervision. If aggressors owe debts to their victims, or the victims' enforcement companies, which they cannot pay, then these detention companies might purchase these debts and give the aggressors the opportunity to work off their debts in the employ of the detention companies or their nominees while being confined, as agreed. The detention companies might offer to the aggressors to certify to the reputation tracking companies that once the aggressors have worked off their debts and or maintained certain behavior standards, they are deemed rehabilitated and could be taken off the list of those to be shunned by society. Unlike today's state prisons, the detention companies might compete with each other to attract aggressors, since they could make a profit on the aggressor's labor, and thus there would be some efforts to provide acceptable living conditions for the aggressors. If these detention companies breach their agreements with the aggressors or employ undue aggression against them, then they could, in turn, be sued by the aggressors. In this type of environment, the aggressors are much more likely to be rehabilitated and gain or maintain valuable job skills than they are in today's rape factories and violence training camps that masquerade as state prisons. The role of insurers. As a final thought, it's likely that individuals and businesses wouldn't necessarily have to contract with all these different companies separately to obtain these services. Instead, life, health, property, and liability insurers might undertake the effort to choose, contract with, pay, and monitor the various service providers and bundle a law and order package into their insurance policies. The benefit to the insurer arises because the insurer is the firm which would be liable to compensate a policyholder who is the victim of aggression. So, if the protection services could reduce violent crime and the adjudication and enforcement services could speed resolution of disputes, then the insurer's costs would be lower. In the case of a dispute between two policyholders with the same insurer, the insurer could easily direct resolution of the dispute because the two policyholders would have agreed in advance to be bound by the law and order systems the insurer put in place. 
With respect to disputes between policyholders with insurers, insurers would be motivated to establish among themselves, in advance, dispute resolution procedures to cover these instances. This is because a. Each insurer knows that there will be multiple such situations over time in which sometimes their policyholders would be the victims and other times the aggressors. So they have to act fairly at all times if they expect reciprocity from other insurers. And b. It is always less costly to resolve disputes peacefully rather than violently. Insurers would be motivated to try to alter the behavior of their policyholders to reduce the incidence of violent disputes and the quantum of losses. This happens today. Insurers offer reduced premiums for defensive driving, e.g. for installing a burglar alarm, taking a safe driving course, etc., and use deductibles to ensure that policyholders have some skin in the game before the insurance kicks in, to reduce moral hazard. Myth 17. We'd be defenseless. The last thing a statist will ever concede is that a defense against external aggression does not have to be provided by the state. The statist just knows that this is the public good, par excellence. To the contrary, earlier I discussed the defects in the so-called public good argument in favor of state-provided national defense. There is nothing distinctive about any good or service, even national defense, that could ever justify such good or service being supplied coercively by a monopoly. So, how might this work in a libertarian society? A stateless world would have less conflict. In a stateless world, there would likely be much less need for collective defense capabilities against external aggression. Much of today's international conflict arises because one state acts aggressively towards another, either attacking that state or provoking an attack by seeking to interfere in the other state's operations. States do this because the individuals at the state responsible for this aggression, a do not do any of the fighting themselves, and B, can coercively seize their citizens' income to pay for this aggression. In a stateless world, very few men would travel to foreign territories at their own cost to physically fight strangers to try to conquer their territory or stay there to try to influence their society. Likewise, Few men would be able to afford or want to spend the billions of dollars spent today to hire other men to travel overseas to seize territory or influence another society. Another source of conflict today is individuals at the state oppressing segments of their own population based on race, religion, ethnicity, etc. And sometimes internal oppression by state A also leads to interstate war as another state, state B, attacks state A to try to stop this internal oppression. Again, the individuals leading state A can engage in this oppression at minimal personal cost because they have others both doing the dirty work and coercively funding these activities. So too with the individuals leading state B in attacking state A. Imagine if these men had to engage in and or fund the violence themselves. There would be a lot less of it. Internal oppression is partly facilitated by the state disarming its citizens through gun control legislation. The most oppressive regimes in history have generally preceded their program of violence by prohibiting the private ownership of firearms, often justified as necessary to reduce violent crime. However, if only the state is armed, then the group targeted for oppression is defenseless. In a libertarian world, there would be no restrictions on firearm ownership. It would be much harder for one group to oppress another since the target group could be fully armed too. Widespread firearm ownership would be a reason to expect less intersocietal conflict. If a man wanted to hire a group of aggressors to travel overseas and seize territory, then they would face an armed population fighting to defend their own families and property. 
which history has shown is the most difficult force to defeat. E.g., in ancient times, the Greek cities holding off the Persian Empire, the Viet Cong versus the U.S. invaders in the 1960s, and the Afghans versus the Soviet invaders in the late 1970s. Another factor tending to increase conflict in today's world of highly centralized states is that it is relatively easy to control vast amounts of territory simply by winning a state versus state war. In highly centralized states, a relatively small number of people and institutions control all of the internal territory. And thus, an aggressor state has only to win control of the other state's locus of power in order to gain control over the other state's entire territory, as opposed to physically fight on each square foot of its territory. In a stateless world, however, there would be no locus of power to seize control of. In a sense, the aggressor would have to defeat every single household one at a time. That is almost an impossible task that would surely stretch an aggressor's resources intolerably, particularly given that, after seizing each house, the aggressor would also have to hold it indefinitely. History has shown that the most difficult part of a prolonged war is seizing and holding more and more ground, because this stretches supply lines to the breaking point. The final point to make relates to the importance of free trade. States often erect prohibitions or restrictions on individuals in one state trading with individuals in another state through the imposition of sanctions, tariffs, quotas, exchange controls, regulatory distortions, etc. These trade barriers make war less costly. If individuals in State A already cannot fully and freely trade with individuals in State B, then the cost of State A going to war with State B is lower, since there is no, or less, commercial trade that would suffer. In a stateless world, however, there would be no artificial trade barriers. Everyone would be free to trade with everyone else. This effectively increases the cost to any society of starting a conflict with another society, since such a conflict would risk damaging or destroying actual or potential customers and or suppliers. Put another way, the more free trade that exists, the less likely is war, since it makes no sense to degrade key parts of one's own economic ecosystem. Libertarian Defense in a World with States That is all well and good if there were no states at all, but what if a libertarian society existed in a world with states? The first point to note is that a few of the above concepts would still be valid. There would be no aggressive activity by the libertarian society directed towards states, so there would be less provocation sparking conflict. An aggressor state would face an armed population in a libertarian society, and there would be no locus of power to seize or obtain control of the libertarian society's territory. In addition, individuals in the libertarian society would be eager to trade with individuals in the existing states, and, to the extent that such trade existed, as noted above, this would increase the cost to those states of attacking the libertarian society. However, there is also reason to believe that individuals in a libertarian society would still demand some protection against potential aggressor states. Where there is demand, production is sure to follow. Of course, the general demand for protective services would be quite different in a libertarian society, since there would be a range of services to purchase and each individual would be voluntarily choosing whether to purchase these services, and if so, which ones. He would be a lot more discriminating than our citizens of the states who get no choice and are compelled to pay. There would likely be little to no demand for offensive capabilities to project force around the world and interfere with other societies. Demand would likely exist only for purely defensive and rescue capabilities. Indeed, some individuals might decide that, since their society is no threat to others, the chances of an invasion are low enough to conclude that it would not be worth purchasing any protection at all. 
instead of the coercive monopolistic provider of protection that is characteristic of today's states, in a libertarian society, there would be numerous competitive providers offering different products tailored to customers' actual needs. Such providers would have to offer value to their customers since they would need to persuade customers to voluntarily part with their money. Perhaps those in coastal societies would want to pay for some waterborne defense services, but those in the middle of a large landmass might not. Those in difficult-to-reach mountainous regions might decide to forego purchasing much in the way of defense services, figuring that the terrain is sufficient protection against invasion. Those living in high-profile cities, which could be likely targets, might want to pay up for more protection, and those living in rural areas might want less. Those who live in a high-risk target area might want to purchase missile defense protection, and if this is too expensive, then they could either move or try to persuade others of their fears and have them pay for such protection, too. Those who travel overseas a lot might want to purchase highly mobile, skilled bodyguard and or hostage rescue services, while those who don't travel much wouldn't have any interest in spending their money on these types of forces. Just as in any other industry, competition among defense service firms would tend to bring, or at least hold, down prices and increase innovation and quality. A provider of defense services that engaged in the type of aggressive activities undertaken around the globe by the U.S. government today and or which is constantly involved in violent conflict with states would find its costs increasing dramatically and thus it would have to increase its prices or cut its services to remain profitable. If his customers were not willing to pay higher prices or accept a reduction in service, or they disagreed with the service provider's actions, then they would look to competing less aggressive and thus lower cost providers. Likewise, a provider that didn't deliver adequate protection would gain a bad reputation and would lose customers to competitors. What if a private protective services provider fails in its duties? Lives are at stake. Yet, this is no different from today with the state. What if the state fails? In the U.S., see Pearl Harbor, the first attack on the World Trade Center, 9-11, the Boston Marathon, etc. The difference is that in a libertarian society, such a private provider would go out of business whereas today the state just continues to be the monopoly provider and, in fact, grows its budget with each failure to protect. Collective Defense As noted earlier with respect to law and order services, it is not likely that individual consumers and businesses would have to select, contract with, and monitor each provider for each type of defense service. For instance, Developers of residential communities and owners of industrial parks, office buildings, hotels, malls, roads, etc., might purchase defense protection for their properties for the benefit of their residents, tenants, customers. Such owners could build the cost of this protection into the fees that they charge for use of their properties. Indeed, even these owners might not have to purchase defense protection individually, they could form associations or federations across a broader region to purchase such protection as a group. However, it is more likely that life, health, and property insurers would purchase defense protection for their policyholders. Since these are the insurers that would have to pay out on claims if someone were killed or injured or their property damaged by an external aggressor, these insurers would be motivated to purchase the most efficient form of protective services for their policyholders. Also, since insurers are in the business of assessing and pricing risk, they could charge different premiums for different risk profiles. This would ensure, for instance, that those who choose to live in higher risk locations would pay for that choice. Further, since insurers aggregate the interests of millions of policyholders, they would have the economies of scale and financial clout to purchase large-scale defense protection. What about the really expensive stuff? 
How would a libertarian society pay for certain defense products that today are very expensive, e.g. a nuclear arsenal, a submarine fleet to guard the coastline, an air force, etc.? There are several responses to this. First, part of the reason that these products are so expensive today is that the buyer is the state and the seller universe is restricted by state licensing rules. As a buyer, the state doesn't have the same pricing discipline as private citizens do. This is because the individuals at the state are not paying with their own funds and thus have no financial incentives to bargain for lower prices and may even be motivated to overpay if the defense vendors are cronies who could provide other benefits to the relevant state personnel. In a libertarian society, the buyers would all be private, expending their own funds, and thus they would be much more demanding of sellers. Sellers would have to compete, including on price, to accommodate buyers' preferences. On the sell side, the state only permits certain vendors to operate in the defense industry. Using excuses such as security clearance to restrict the number of sellers, in a libertarian society, there would be no coercive restriction on the number of sellers, which would tend to put downward pressure on pricing through the impact of greater competition. Second, it is not clear that the really expensive products would actually be in demand in a stateless society. It's not a valid question to ask how, in a libertarian society, we could afford the national defense the state provides today because, as discussed above, in a libertarian society, the defense protection demanded might be very different. Third, as also noted above, the likely involvement of insurers would enable the efficient pooling of expenditure on behalf of millions of policyholders, which could be directed towards expensive defense products which are in actual demand. Fourth, the private sector might develop innovative ways to enable the purchase of the most expensive defense products. Defense product vendors or the capital markets might provide financing options to buyers so that payments could be made over time instead of up front. Large businesses or associations of smaller businesses might figure that it's worth voluntarily contributing to the defense bill because if potential customers were killed or their property destroyed, then that would be bad for business. People might make voluntary contributions over and above their contractual payments just because they believe that this is the right thing to do, like tipping a cab driver or waiter, even though you might never see them again. Wealthy philanthropists might feel inclined to establish charitable foundations to contribute. Myth 18, There Goes the Environment, Statists assume that the environment would go to hell if we don't have the wise custodians at the state looking out for us and Mother Earth. Their incorrect assumption is that, in the absence of centralized, coercive regulations, there would be no regulation at all of human activity. The shortcomings of state regulation of the environment were discussed earlier, I'll provide below some ideas of how environmental regulation might work in a libertarian society. Rely on private property rights. What the statist line of thinking misses is that environmental problems are nothing more than property disputes. A's activities cause damage to B's body or property, for which B could take action against A to stop the activities through an injunction or to be compensated for his losses through an award of money damages. This is no different from any other property dispute in society. Thus, in a libertarian society, these issues would be properly resolved as property disputes. For instance, if A's activities emit pollutants, which cause B to lose some enjoyment of his property, or damage to B's body, then, subject to one exception, a would have initiated aggression against B's property and would be liable. The exception relates to homesteading. If A were engaging in these activities on his own land, which was adjacent to some unowned land, and subsequently B homesteaded the unowned land, 
then A would be regarded as having homesteaded the right to continue these activities before B homesteaded the unowned land. And thus, B would acquire a property right in this land subject to A's right to continue with his prior level of activity. In other words, B could not complain about A's activities if he moved in and these activities were already going on. However, if A increases the volume of his polluting activities or changes their nature, then A would be liable to B, as A would not have homesteaded the right to these increased or different activities. Conversely, if B homesteaded the land before A commenced these activities, then B would be deemed to have homesteaded the right to a pollutant-free enjoyment of his property, and A's subsequent initiation of these polluting activities would render him liable to B. Any subsequent purchaser of either A's or B's land would purchase these plots of land with whatever homesteaded rights the seller, A or B, had. In all cases, either party would be free to approach the other to try to negotiate a different set of rights. Unlike what happens under statist regimes, whereby regulations are made without taking into account the preferences of the respective property owners, instead the preferences of those at the state and their lobbying interests are imposed coercively. Such a private negotiation would enable a true expression by the parties of their relative value preferences for continuing to pollute or for clean air, as the case may be. For instance, if B had the right to stop A from polluting, then A could do one of several things. A. Pay for technology and processes to reduce or eliminate the pollution. B. Offer to pay B sufficiently for B to install protective features on his property to reduce or eliminate his losses. Or C. Offer to buy B's property outright. Whether A chooses to do any of these things would reflect how valuable he regards his polluting activities and whether B agrees to B or C and for what price would reflect how valuable he regards remaining in place free of pollution. If an environmental group took a different view from B regarding what is acceptable on his property, and thus, regardless of B's views, wanted to reduce A's polluting emissions further, then that group would be free to do one of several things. X. Offer to buy A out of his land, and then shut down his factory. Y. Offer to pay for A to reduce his emissions to the level that the group feels is acceptable, or Z, offer to buy B's property and then sue A as the new adjacent property owner. How much the environmental group would be prepared to pay for each of these options would reflect how valuable they regard the reduction of emissions. Private versus Public Property One of the main environmental issues with statism regimes is that a lot of land and waterways are publicly owned. This has three ramifications. First, no one maintains property as well as the actual owner, who has his own financial capital invested. Look at the state of public housing and public parks compared with private housing and private parks, respectively. Second, when the state owns property, at best it tries to balance the interest of different groups and generally ends up satisfying none or few of them, if one of these groups owned the property itself, then it could protect its interests more vigorously. Third, what often happens is that the most aggressive lobbying group ends up effectively controlling the property through getting state regulations written in its favor, and thus it coercively buys the property at a huge discount. It really only has to pay the lobbying costs compared with what it would have had to pay in the free market. Contrast this with the libertarian world in which all property would be privately owned, unless unowned. Consider the case of a privately owned river. The owner would have invested effort and financial capital in homesteading the river or buying it from a prior legitimate owner and therefore would have the best incentive to keep it pollutant-free, either for his own use or because he wants to supply clean water to his customers e.g. local residents or businesses. 
the standard of cleanliness of the river would be much higher when privately owned than when controlled by the state, where no one has any vested interest. If the river owner contracted with local customers to supply them with clean water and fails to deliver such water, then he would lose customers and could be sued. He would therefore have a strong incentive to take remedial or preventive action against upstream polluting factories or other bad actors. The downstream users wouldn't have to get involved with the factories to determine who was responsible. Their grievance would be directly against the river owner. Air pollution would be dealt with in a similar manner. For instance, all of the roads would be privately owned, so if someone living adjacent to a road, who has homesteaded a right to clean air, suffers from air pollution, then he wouldn't have to worry about which cars caused his pollution. Instead, as noted earlier, his cause of action would be against the road owner. The road owner would thus have the incentive to manage the traffic on his road to ensure that impermissible levels of pollution were not emitted. For instance, he might require inspections of vehicles before granting them permits to drive on his roads. The Roles of Insurers and Pollution Consultants Note that it is likely in the above examples that the river owner, the road owner, and the factory owner would all have liability insurance. The relative insurers would require or financially motivate these owners to take appropriate preventive action to minimize the risk of environmental lawsuits. These insurers would bring current best practices from their portfolio of similar clients. So in this way, those methods that were most effective would spread among different regions, but be tailored to the specific circumstances in each case and be updated in real time as circumstances change. Contrast this with the centralized regulations imposed by the individuals at the state, which are one-size-fits-all, typically lag market or technological developments, and are written based on input from lobbying interests as opposed to what is most effective. The insurers would not necessarily be expert in matters such as measuring pollution, determining causation, assessing pollution control technology and compliance and monitoring. In a society in which such services would be in demand from insurers, businesses, and litigants, it is likely that expert firms, call them pollution consultants, would arise to provide these services. Unlike today's state regulators who purport to serve as expert consultants but are really coercive monopolists, lacking proper financial incentives, in a libertarian society, the pollution consultants would have to compete to win customers. Those that develop a good reputation would garner more business, and those that provide shoddy services would lose business. Myth 19. Somalia disproves the case for libertarianism. Prior to the 1990s, Somalia operated under a repressive statist regime. And then, in 1991, this regime was thrown out, and the country operated without a central state at least up until 2006. Somalia has always been a desperately poor and dangerous place, both when it had and did not have a central state. Statists love to point to Somalia and ask, is that how a libertarian society would look? However, this is an intentionally disingenuous rhetorical question. When comparing libertarianism to statism, it is unreasonable to compare this across different cultures. Each culture has a different set of norms, propensities toward violence, respect for others, capital stock, etc., the libertarian is not suggesting that libertarianism would cleanse a rough culture of its inherent characteristics. He is saying that, for a given culture, a libertarian society would be more peaceful, just, and prosperous than the statist version. In other words, it is unreasonable to compare Somalia without a state to the U.S. with a state. The latter may still be a better place to live because of its preferable inherent characteristics. The more reasonable way to approach this is to look at Somalia without a state compared with Somalia with a state. 
As it happens, there is some research that has been conducted on this point. The paper summarizing that research suggests that living standards improved once the state was eliminated. Per the conclusion in that paper, this paper's main contribution to the literature has been to compare Somalia's living standards to those of 41 other sub-Saharan African countries, both before and after the collapse of the national government, we find that Somalia's living standards have generally improved and that they compare relatively favorably with many existing African states. Importantly, we find that Somali living standards have often improved, not just in absolute terms, but also relative to other African countries, since the collapse of the Somali central government. The Danger of Centralization in a culture where violence is widespread, the worst political configuration is to have one group in central control of the state visiting its violence on the population as a whole with no limiting factor. This is particularly so where the state has first disarmed the population through gun control legislation. In these situations, the cost of such violence to those at the state is minimal. This has been a big part of the problem in some of the most despotic parts of Africa, including Somalia. In these situations, it would be better to have a, no central authority, but rather a range of competing warlords, each of whom acts as a countervailing force to the others, and or b, a fully armed population. Then the cost of violence to any would-be overlord would be much more significant. Culture is key to outcomes. Statists irrationally fear that a place like the U.S. would become Somalia if we didn't have a state. However, a culture which is relatively nonviolent and relatively respectful of individual rights is likely to remain so in the absence of a state simply because those cultural norms are inherent in each individual. In other words, a place such as the U.S. is not likely to devolve into Somalia if we move to a stateless society because that is not how people operate in the U.S. today when they have some degrees of freedom to act. To elaborate, in the U.S. today, the vast majority of people peacefully accept temporary rule from the political party which obtains a majority in any election, even if they don't agree with that party's policies and legislation. Statists who voted for the opposition generally don't go around killing people who voted for or who are part of the winning political party. They wait until the next election to try to elect their preferred party. If that is the culture we have now, then it doesn't make sense to worry that if the U.S. were to become a stateless society where each group could voluntarily choose its own policies all the time instead of waiting for the next election, then we would descend into depraved intergroup violence. To put it a different way, if Americans are not particularly violent when living under the opposition's ruler, to put it a different way, if Americans are not particularly violent when living under opposition rulers, then they're not likely to become more violent when they don't have to live under any ruler. Myth 20 Libertarians are shills for the powerful. Statists typically assume that the libertarian's advocacy of the free market means that the libertarian is for the interest of big business and against the interests of the little guy. However, it is actually the case that libertarianism is the only philosophy that is for the little guy. Statism is characterized by special interest groups renting the state's coercive powers to benefit themselves, i.e. crony capitalism. Whether it is big pharmaceutical companies, big agricultural companies, big oil companies, defense companies, alternative energy companies, labor unions, Wall Street, the environmental lobby, etc., the groups that do best under statism are those that lobby most intensively for state support through subsidies, favorable regulations, patents, tariffs, quotas, eminent domain, money supply expansion, etc. This has happened throughout all of history. Whenever there has been a state, it is not unique to any time period or region. However, the one group that does not 
and cannot lobby as effectively as the above interest groups is the group of individuals often each described as the little guy or the average Joe. As noted earlier, the interests of this group are too diffuse to organize, and the benefits to these individuals from lobbying on any particular issue are outweighed by the costs of doing so, even though the benefits from lobbying on all issues together would be enormous. As an entrepreneur, the little guy has to try to make a living navigating through the horrendous and costly maze of state regulations, which special interest groups A. help write to make it harder for the little guy to compete, and B. have much less trouble complying with. The little guy takes whatever portion of his income the state allows him to keep after the myriad of taxes levied, which the special interest groups can avoid through structuring, or minimized by hiring expensive tax advisors, and tries to support his family or reinvest in his business or career. As a consumer, the needs of the average Joe are left to be satisfied by products that, as discussed earlier, are more expensive and less available than they would be absent the state's interference. Unlike special interest groups which rent the state's coercive powers, his life is simply subjugated to these powers. Similarly, as a potential employee, the average Joe faces higher cost and lower quality education and fewer sustainable employment opportunities than would be the case if the state did not interfere in the market. In advocating for the free market, libertarians are simply asking that everyone, big and small, play by the same rules. Namely, whomever best pleases the voluntarily purchasing customer will succeed. Libertarians should therefore be understood to be pro-market, which really means pro-consumer and not pro-business. Libertarians believe that the sole purpose of economic activity is to organize scarce resources to best satisfy consumer preferences and not to safeguard any particular businesses or interest groups, nor to privilege those who want to rely on coercion. Indeed, as Austrian economist Don Boudreau has noted, it is the notion of robust private property rights, the hallmark of libertarianism, which eliminates the distinction between the powerful and the weak. While some may be wealthier than others in a free market society, no one exercises power over others in the sense of being able to force them to act against their wills. The wealthiest individual cannot, without legal consequences, take the poorest individual's property unless the latter sells or gives it to him, or tell the poorest individual what he must or cannot do with his body. Only the state does these things, either directly or through those who rent his coercive powers. As libertarian historian Tom Woods has noted, statists don't appreciate the irony that often the most vigorous opponents of the free market are so-called capitalists. In the free market, businesses would face intense competition every single day. However, if they can get the state on their side, then this makes things much easier for them. Thus, we have the paradox that businesses, big businesses in particular, may be against the free market, while libertarians are very much for the free market. That's difficult to reconcile with the notion that libertarians are shills for the powerful. Myth 21. Libertarians don't care about the poor. Statists pejoratively ask of libertarians, how would the poor survive in a libertarian society? The implication is that it is only through the state that the poor can be clothed, fed, employed, etc. There is a lot to unpack here. Free markets rescue the poor. The status shows a remarkable lack of appreciation of economic history. Poverty has been the default, the natural state of man, for all of history. It was only the advent of nearly free markets, as first embodied in the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries, but which then ultimately took hold in the U.S. and other countries, that lifted the common man out of his dire straits. When the state's influence was at its minimum, meaning there was sound, commodity-based money 
generally gold and silver, and the ability to freely exchange private property and freely associate without interference from the state, man was able to dramatically increase his living standards. He did this by specializing in his labor and by deferring some consumption to provide pools of savings to be invested in developing new technologies and processes, thereby increasing worker productivity. Importantly, Almost every consumer-oriented business that has been successful has achieved this success through constant innovation to bring down the price of goods to make them accessible to the masses. It is much harder to achieve success on a grand scale by selling only to the rich. Thus, the poor in the U.S. are able to afford things like wide varieties of food, clothing and shelter, color televisions, air conditioning, refrigerators, flushing toilets, cars, and air travel, not to mention the ubiquitous mobile device even in the most poverty-stricken neighborhoods. As noted earlier, the poorest members of free market-oriented societies live better now than royalty lived a couple of hundred years ago. We can also see this effect in the U.S., even using government statistics. The so-called poverty rate declined dramatically over the course of the 20th century in the midst of a relatively free market regime, until the massive expansion of the state in the late 1960s and early 1970s as part of the launch of President Johnson's War on Poverty. At that point, however, the poverty rate flattened out and has declined much less since, despite trillions of dollars having been spent by the state on this faux war. Looked at another way, where would you prefer to be poor? In freer markets, such as the U.S., or in less free markets, such as Cuba, North Korea, and Venezuela? If more freedom is better for the poor, then why is total freedom not the best? Statism is really just central planning, which surely has been repudiated by the implosion of the Soviet Union and the desperate statuses of Cuba, North Korea, and Venezuela, to name a few examples. The only difference economically between those regimes and the statist U.S. is the amount of central planning in those countries. Every industry was or is completely centrally planned. In the U.S., every industry is partly centrally planned. If central planning as a concept does not work, then why tolerate any of it? Statists believe that there is a correct amount of central planning and that only they know this amount. But they will never tell you what this amount is, definitely. Generally, it is defined as whatever amount they are proposing at any one point in time. This just strains credulity. There are plenty of non-state resources to help the poor. What about the statist perennial favorite, namely that leaving everything to the market wouldn't help those who fall between the cracks? There are several ways to respond to this. One way is to note that the market is not some impersonal machine, but rather millions of individuals interacting voluntarily on a daily basis. Likewise, the state is not an impersonal machine, but also comprises, unfortunately, millions of individuals. When the statist claims that the state is superior to the market in preventing some people from falling between the cracks, he is implying that only those at the state have the awareness, compassion, and ability to help these people. On what basis could we conclude that the millions of people not working for the state are not concerned to help their neighbors in need, and that this concern is held exclusively by the millions of people at the state? Moreover, even if this were true, in a libertarian world these millions of people now working for the state would still be around, just not as part of the state and thus they could still express and act on their concerns, and the poorest could still benefit from their magnanimity. Another response is that, as noted earlier, civil society comprises many parts, the individual, families, 
neighborhoods, religious groups, charities, mutual aid societies, self-help organizations, businesses, trade groups, and the state. In a libertarian world, the only one of these societal parts that would be missing is the state. Is it not possible that, for the few who might fall between the cracks, there might be some part of what remains of civil society, absent the state, that could help these people? One of the shortcomings that statists suffer from is the tyranny of the present. What this means, in this context, is that they assume that a libertarian world would look exactly like the present world, minus the state's welfare programs. To the contrary, many aspects of society would be very different. For instance, it is highly likely that, at a minimum, institutions of civil society that once existed, but which have been crowded out over time by the expanding welfare state, would have room to flourish, perhaps growing again to the prominence they once had in helping the neediest, before the state's role exploded in the 1960s. In fact, if the statists in civil society who elect the state into being do so primarily to help the neediest, then presumably they would still care about the neediest in the absence of the state. Are statists claiming that they themselves would become less interested in helping the neediest if there was no state? Boiling it all down, both a libertarian society and a statist society would comprise all the same individuals, and all the same social institutions, bar one, the state. Thus, the only difference between a libertarian society and a statist society is the ability to coerce others. The statist is effectively saying that he cannot envision marshalling sufficient resources to help the neediest through his own actions and persuasion, and thus must rely on force. The statist must hold a very dim view of his fellow citizens. One wonders why he would even want to live among them. Nevertheless, this does not justify the immorality of one man coercing another. There would be fewer poor. Another example of tyranny of the present thinking is the statist implicit assumption that if the state ceased to exist, then we'd have at least the same number of poor as we do now, however one counts them. Yet, in a libertarian world with the free market, we would expect that there would be fewer destitute people. As discussed earlier regarding the free market, without a state, there would be a more and better paying jobs since absent taxes and regulations, the cost of employing workers would be lower, there would be more capital equipment available per worker to increase each worker's productivity, and workers would be free to make their own risk-reward trade-offs when accepting employment. B. More opportunities for entrepreneurs to pursue freed from the costs and restrictions placed on them by taxes and regulations. And C more goods in the market at lower prices as the costs of production and the range of permissible products are freed from the impediments imposed by taxes and regulations. In addition, one of the key insights of Austrian economics is that the state's central planning of the money supply and interest rates and control of the banking system, primarily through the actions of the state's central bank, have major adverse consequences for the economy. The key state action in this respect is causing, and or facilitating, the artificial expansion of the money supply, which causes both the artificial suppression of interest rates and effective, even if not always visible, economy-wide price inflation over time. There are three main consequences of such state action, all of which hit the least well-off particularly hard and none of which would occur in the free market. First, economy-wide boom-bust business cycles are caused by the artificial manipulation of interest rates, and the downturn portion of these cycles has a more significant adverse impact on the least well-off than it does on others. Second, when new money is created and injected into the economy, 
the resulting price inflation impoverishes the least well-off relative to those who are the closest cronies of the state. This is because the new money is not injected uniformly, but typically first goes to the connected few, who therefore get to spend it before prices rise, and it is the least well-off who get the new money last, well after prices have risen. Third, due to the artificial suppression of interest rates and effective price inflation, everyone is pushed to take on much more risk in saving for retirement than they would otherwise, and the least well-off can least afford to take these risks. In the free market, one could build up a reasonable retirement fund through the low-risk methods of simply accumulating money in a checking account, or holding it as physical cash, and or lending money to a bank through the use of a savings account bearing a decent interest rate. The value of such money would actually grow over time, due to the general price deflation we would see in the free market, as more goods are produced with very little increase in the money supply, and in the case of savings accounts, the interest income earned. However, in today's low interest rate positive price inflation world, those methods would lead to a real decline in wealth, i.e. after adjusting for price inflation, and so individuals now feel compelled to speculate in the securities markets, real estate, or other high-risk endeavors. More broadly, societal prosperity is directly linked to the amount of stuff produced to satisfy consumer wants. The amount of stuff produced is, in turn, directly linked to the number of man-hours devoted to appropriate, productive activities. When there is a state, a significant number of man-hours are devoted to activities that have nothing to do with satisfying consumers' wants. These man-hours include the time spent by individuals who work for the state in either creating or enforcing regulations, the time spent by individuals in lobbying the state to rent its coercive powers, the time spent by individuals who have successfully rented the state's coercive powers in producing stuff otherwise than in accordance with what would be produced in the free market, and the time spent by individuals in complying with the state's regulatory whims. Then there are the man-hours devoted by individuals trying to avoid the state's whims. Imagine all of the additional prosperity we would have if all of the aforementioned people, time, effort, and resources were instead engaged in appropriate productive activities. Finally, the state incarcerates in cages thousands of potentially productive individuals for victimless crimes, which substantially and probably permanently impairs the earning power of these individuals, never mind the destructive effect that it has on their lives and families, likely condemning many of them to impoverishment. Without a state, these individuals would be free not only to better their own lives, but the lives of those with whom they enter into voluntary exchanges. Freedom of Movement Another aspect of the state that adversely impacts poverty is the state's regulation of immigration. Many of the world's poor would have much better lives, better job prospects, more goods and services available to purchase and at lower prices if they were free to move to places with more liberty than where they live today. States create and enforce artificial national borders and establish category-based immigration restrictions based on geography, ethnicity, family ties, etc., all of these restrictions prevent the poorest individuals from moving to places where they could better flourish. In a libertarian world, these centrally imposed restrictions would not exist. All property in use would be privately owned, so whether someone from another region could move here would be based on the individual decisions of the transport providers and local private property owners. Businesses would be free to invite host, and employ immigrants from other regions, as would relatives, ethnic associations, charities, etc. These decisions would be made on an individual basis using privately established criteria, 
and it is likely that more of the world's poor would be able to more easily move to where the opportunities lie. The statist, who advocates both for the poor and for the state-based immigration barriers, is essentially saying that his concern for the poor only extends to those located inside an artificially created geographic area. However, why should the plight of someone inside this area be more important than that of someone outside this area? It certainly makes sense that people feel more compassion for those in their immediate neighborhood as they live with and see these people all the time. But by what logic should a statist in New York feel more strongly about a poor person in Seattle than a poor person in Toronto? He knows neither personally, and the poor person in Toronto is actually geographically closer to New York than is the poor person in Seattle. It is as if the U.S.-Canadian border possesses some magical anti-compassion feature. Why should anyone allow the individuals at the state to define which poor people in the world they are allowed to be concerned about? The morality of it all. The argument that the state is necessary to help the neediest is a utilitarian argument. Such an argument is, in effect, saying that the statist believes that if he perceives some people as being in need, then he is justified in coercively taking resources away from others he perceives as not being in need because the ends are worthy. The statist does not, or at least cannot, deny that his means involve coercion, not that the definition of in need is entirely subjective. On the other hand, the moral perspective looks at means used. As noted earlier, it is immoral for one man to initiate force against another. Thus, in the case of state-managed welfare, the fact that the objective is to help the needy doesn't alter the fact that the proposed use of coercion is immoral. In a libertarian world, all welfare would be voluntary, and thus the means would be moral as well as the ends being worthy. And, as discussed earlier, there are many non-coercive alternatives for aiding the poor. One final point, if the utilitarian argument is to prevail over the moral argument, then why not just cease treating robbery as a crime and allow the neediest to freely rob the well-off directly? Why bother using the state as a middleman to engage in this robbery with all of its overhead costs and the complicating personal incentives of those who work at the state? Myth 22. Libertarians are pro-prostitution and pro-narcotics. The statist believes that if he regards an activity as undesirable, then the state should prohibit it. Accordingly, Statists also believe that if libertarians are against the state prohibiting an activity, then libertarians must be for the activity itself, either personally or as a statement of values that society ought to hold. To pick on prostitution as an example, the myth runs as follows. Since the libertarian does not believe that the state should forcibly throw people into cages for voluntarily purchasing and selling sex, the libertarian, therefore, likes to use prostitutes, wants to be a prostitute, or believes that society should endorse prostitution. The myths suffer from two fallacies. First, as discussed at length previously, libertarianism is simply about the appropriateness of the initiation of force in personal dealings. Being against the use of force says nothing about how one evaluates the merit of the personal dealings in question. Staying with the prostitution example, it is not inconsistent for the libertarian to believe that if two people want to engage in consensual sex involving payment, then they should be free to do so, while at the same time not wanting to personally engage in this type of activity, nor wanting his loved ones to do so. The libertarian believes that the question of whether a voluntary activity which doesn't breach the nap is a virtue or a vice should be answered for each person through privately developed standards and not through centralized legislation backed up by force. However, the state has first thought, whenever he wants to suggest a set of values for society, 
is to use the coercive powers of the state. But the state is the bluntest possible instrument to use, not only because it relies on force, but also because whatever solution it resolves on would be one-size-fits-all solution. Second, in suggesting that we need the state to enforce purported societal values, the statist is conflating society with the state. However, society is not the same as the state. Society is much more extensive. As noted earlier, society comprises many different voluntary institutions as well as the state, e.g. families, neighborhoods, religious groups, charities, mutual aid societies, businesses, etc. To the libertarian, one of the key roles of these non-state institutions, as has always been the case historically, is to create and promote local norms, values, and ethics to help people lead better lives, however defined. Thus, for the statists to claim that without the state's use of force, things like prostitution and narcotics would run rampant in a stateless society is to shortchange the role and impact of these non-state institutions. Both history and logic suggest that, compared with the brutality of imprisonment, these institutions could be very effective in developing norms to discourage self-destructive activities, promote healthier practices, and allow for a more open, humane, and effective way of dealing with those who engage in these activities. Again, it's critical to be clear about what libertarianism is and is not. It is not a statement of personal values. It is simply a philosophy about when the use of force is justified. Myth 23. If it's so good, then why hasn't it ever been tried? Statists believe that there are no historical or current examples of libertarianism in practice. However, there are plenty of examples of societies or segments of societies which have interacted or are currently interacting on a truly or mostly voluntary basis. Statists read, but they do not comprehend. They see, but they do not observe. History. There are a number of historical examples of stateless societies as well as low state societies, i.e. those without the coercive control of a large, centralized, all-pervasive, professionally administered state. At the outset, the most basic point to note is that the concept of the civilized world comprising only large, formal nation-states really only began in the 17th century with the treaties of Westphalia. Before then, societies were organized in numerous different forms. Some societies were stateless, e.g. clans, tribes, and feudal societies. Others had a low-state form, such as monarchies, existing in parallel with private society, with well-defined boundaries between the two, and the ancient Greek and Renaissance Italian city-states. And, of course, there were also the large ancient empires, e.g. Egyptian, Persian, and Roman. In many of these societal forms, unlike with today's nation-states, there was no abstract state which was regarded as separate from the persona of its rulers. There is significant scholarly work noting that a substantial portion of medieval Europe was anarchistic, in the sense not only of being stateless or low state, but being anti-state, meaning that societies, supported by bodies such as the Catholic Church, guilds, universities, and towns, were fiercely opposed to the centralization of political power in and legislative edicts issued by large sovereign states. The development of the law merchant in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance is a very good example of individuals voluntarily developing their own legal system and customs. The law merchant was based on what was generally perceived to be fair and to work effectively to facilitate peaceful trade among a highly mobile population across different regions. Within this merchant community, the threat of being ostracized by one's trading partners was the most important reason to accept adverse judgments rendered by the private courts.
In terms of other stateless legal systems, medieval Iceland and Ireland operated with purely voluntary conflict resolution regimes, and in the U.S., the development of the West initially operated quite efficiently and peacefully before the federal and state governments got involved. It turned out that the wild, wild West was not so wild after all. In addition, in Europe in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the small region known as Morrisnet operated peacefully and prosperously as a low state, neutral zone for about 100 years. And, as noted earlier, contemporary Somalia, while no stateless paradise, saw a measurable improvement in living standards when it was stateless in the 1990s and 2000s relative to when it had a central state. More generally, as noted previously, every single function that is carried out by the modern nation-state, including defense, policing, courts and law, roads, education, etc., was at one time carried out by private parties on a non-coercive basis until the state took it over for its own purposes. Most importantly, many of these functions are still carried out privately today in different parts of the world. The International Community The most obvious and significant current example of libertarianism is the international community vis-à-vis -vis one another, the various nation-states exist in a condition of political anarchy. There is no world state coercively governing all nation-states. Accordingly, many aspects of what a libertarian society would look like domestically are in operation today internationally. For instance, taking the collection of the nation-states as a single society, there are competing protection forces, courts, bodies of law, currencies, approaches to regulation, etc. There is no group of central planners taxing and or subsidizing nation-states, handing out special privileges to crony nation-states, or dictating which nation-states may produce what, at what price goods must be sold, etc. The NAP is generally respected among nation-states in the sense that no nation-state asserts the right to coerce another. The individuals working at each nation-state interact with individuals working at other nation-states on a completely voluntary basis. In some sense, the homesteading principle is also respected. Nation-states have delineated boundaries of property that they control, which they claim as their own, and these boundaries are, for the most part, accepted by other nation-states. Similarly, when a nation-state peacefully declares borders around ocean-based economic zones and portions of outer space for their satellites, this homesteading is generally respected, too. If one nation-state trespasses onto the claimed property of another, then the right of self-defense is well recognized. The most acceptable form of interaction within the international community is not through coercion, but rather via voluntary agreements, treaties, and voluntary associations such as the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, NATO, etc. Each such association freely decides on which nation-states may join and which may not. If some nation-states are not invited to join a particular association, then they are free to set up a competing association. If invited, a nation-state is free to join and financially support an association, but is also free to leave. Yes, there are wars and other conflicts, just as there is within a nation-state, but these constitute the minority of the millions of interactions that happen daily among nation-states. As discussed earlier, it's noteworthy that the individuals at a nation-state are content to live in a libertarian existence relative to their contemporaries at other nation-states. But they are not prepared to live this way among their own citizens, whom they prefer to rule by force. Local Communities At the smaller unit level today we have cruise ships, which are essentially floating stateless societies. Private residential communities, the private cities of Columbia in Maryland, Co-op City in New York, 
and Reston in Virginia, Walt Disney World, shopping malls, corporate campuses, hotels, kibbutzes, etc. They each have their own civic goods, i.e. roads, parks, waste disposal, security, etc., and regulations and customs, or law, and they operate efficiently and fairly without a state-style coercion. In fact, every voluntary association is a case study of libertarianism. People come together and may leave voluntarily, make their own rules of interaction, financially support the objectives on a voluntary basis, and may similarly withdraw such support, and, for the most part, interact peacefully. There are no implied or actual threats of incarceration at gunpoint for failure to carry out or finance these groups' stated objectives. One objection that statists might raise to the applicability of these examples is that these voluntary groups only operate on a relatively small scale, and thus voluntarism may not be an appropriate form of interaction for a nation-sized population. That might be true. But this objection would be another example of tyranny of the present thinking and would miss the point. In a libertarian world, there wouldn't be any nation-states, so there would be no need to find forms of interaction that work at the national level. Even in a world with nation-states, as we have today, a small-scale group with shared interests, where the governors and governed are very close, is the most natural, accepted, and therefore effective method of ordered association. Thus, within large regional populations, voluntarism would work well to provide order if the governance model were a mosaic of many small, voluntary, shared interest groups, and any individual might belong to a multitude of such groups. On the other hand, nation-states, where the rulers are distant, the populations large, and interests diverse, necessarily try to create unnatural, less accepted, and thus less effective large group interactions, which therefore require force to implement. Thus, by its very nature, the nation-state governance model is doomed to ultimately fail. But even if these examples didn't exist, as relevant and illuminating as these examples are, even if these examples did not exist, it would not weaken the case for libertarianism. Just because a particular form of governance hasn't existed yet doesn't mean that it couldn't arise in the future and that it couldn't be superior to what came before it. Notwithstanding this logic, statists often argue that if there hasn't been an enduring stateless society, then that must prove that such a governance form is not technically feasible and or is inferior. But by this logic, the present form of any idea is always the evolutionary end point. Framed this way, I'm not sure even the most ardent statist would agree. In fact, most statists are always arguing for changes to the state's form, mostly to increase its powers. Imagine if, before the first modern democracy arose, a monarchist had pointed out that the idea of democracy died in the ancient world and thus it must not be technically feasible and or is inferior to monarchy. Should that have been conclusive as to the feasibility of democracy or the desirability or probability of democracy arising again? In addition, since statists believe that modern democracies are an improvement over the pre-existing monarchies, how can they honestly argue that it is impossible for societal governance to evolve again in a positive direction and into a very different form? Is it possible to reach the end of history? In that respect, a quick survey of history would show that societal governance has never been static, but continually changes, and from the perspective of individual liberty, zigs and zags, sometimes changing for the better and sometimes for the worse. For instance, the European continent has had clan-based societies, democracies, republics, empires, feudal societies, stateless societies, highly fragmented anarchistic tending societies, city-states, monarchies, 
communist dictatorships, fascist dictatorships, and modern nation-states, just to name a subset. Finally, consider the abolitionists in the U.S. in the 19th century trying to make their case against slavery. At that time, slavery was and always had been ubiquitous. Are we to believe that the abolitionists had no valid case to make because there had never been a world without slavery? Myth 24. Libertarianism is a futile endeavor. Statists often criticize libertarianism on the basis that it is unrealistic and that libertarians are too idealistic. We are told that a stateless society has never existed and never will exist, so why bother believing in it and pursuing it as an organizing principle? There are a number of ways to respond to this, both in terms of principle and in practice. Principles First, by the above metrics, statists are idealistic too. For instance, they would desire a world without murder, yet none has ever existed or will exist, but statists still try to educate others as to why murder is wrong and try to reduce it where possible. If idealistic means advocating for something different from the current state of affairs, then who isn't idealistic? Second, as noted earlier, Political philosophy and the organization of society have been evolving for thousands of years. Who is to say that such evolution is over? When the Roman Empire was at its zenith, ruling much of the known world, it might have been difficult to conceive that an alternative would one day emerge. Likewise, when monarchy was the prevailing system in Western Europe. In the 18th and 19th centuries, when slavery was a global institution in the so-called civilized countries, it might have been very difficult to conceive that one day most of the world would recognize its abhorrence. For those living under Eastern European communism in the 20th century, it might have been very difficult to conceive that one day they would be living free of that yoke. Political organizational forms change over time. And it seems that, as time goes on, the changes happen more rapidly, perhaps because new technologies allow new ideas to spread more rapidly. So who is to say that it is impossible that growing numbers of people could reject the idea of the state and form stateless mini-societies? Third, if you believe that a particular principle for organizing society is just, in this case the NAP, then even if you cannot hope to immediately attain 100% of your ultimate goal, in this case a stateless society, how could you work to move society towards that goal until you first set that goal? In other words, you need first to know your destination before you can set out on your journey. You don't need to magically appear instantly at your end destination to achieve success, although that would be nice. You could set your destination and then continually take incremental steps towards it. Libertarians believe in the moral superiority of a stateless society, and by setting this as the destination, it becomes very clear which policies in today's society to oppose and which to support. It means having a guiding principle, as opposed to just going by gut or blindly following a political party or personality. Practical Steps Even in today's overwhelmingly statist world, it is not true that libertarians have no means to advance our cause. There are a number of meaningful things that libertarians can do and are doing to promote libertarianism. Pursue and promote alternative education As discussed earlier, the state can only exist with the acquiescence of the majority of the population because the individuals in the private sector vastly outnumber the individuals at the state, as large as that number is. Thus, educating people about the true nature of and problems with the state, and the fact that there is a real alternative to the state, must surely be a first step in turning that acquiescence into skepticism, if not outright opposition. Historically, the state has had a huge advantage in influencing the content taught in schools and at college, given the all-pervasive, purposeful control of education by the state and the intellectuals who support it. 
However, with the advent of the Internet and powerful mobile devices, alternative content is now easily within the reach of those who want to learn about different political philosophies, whether at home or on the go. And there is a growing array of homeschooling and self-study resources available at one's fingertips. Thus, there's a good reason to be optimistic in this regard. As the societal conflicts caused by statism grow more extensive and more intense, and as more national crises cause people to question whether the current system is the best we can hope for, many people, particularly the young, are looking for new ideas. The libertarian should not only keep improving his own understanding of libertarian principles, but even more importantly, should provide those who are looking for an alternative with guidance on how to find the rich body of libertarian educational resources that exist. Refrain from participating in elections. Of all the arguments for the state, the state has favored is that elections indicate the consent of the population to the state and its policies. The state gleefully uses voter turnout figures to claim that there is a post-election mandate for this or that, and that the people have spoken. Thus, to do his part to reduce voter turnout, the libertarian should refrain from voting and try to convince others to do the same. To the statist, the fewer the votes cast, the weaker the mandate coming out of an election. If a weaker mandate means less state activity, then that is generally a good thing for the cause of liberty. Note also that based on probability, voting is a waste of a citizen's time. Statistically, the chance of a single vote determining the outcome of an election and then of that outcome leading to implementation of the voters' desired legislative or executive policy is infinitesimal. Another way to think about elections is that in the grand scheme of things, they don't change anything material. All that happens is that a different team is put at the helm of a destructive vessel that is the state. What really changes society is public opinion. The abolition, women's suffrage, civil rights, the gay rights movement, all preceded state legislative or judicial action. Thus, instead of investing the time to work on a candidate's campaign, or to research candidates or vote, the libertarian might consider a better use of his time to be working to change public opinion through whatever means he prefers. Ridicule public service. Statists laud public service, meaning working for the state in either a civilian or military role, as a very honorable activity. The libertarian should do what he can to persuade family, friends, and colleagues to avoid joining the state's apparatus by illustrating how working at the state is actually something to disdain as immoral rather than something to revere. In this way, the libertarian can not only do his part to reduce the size of the state, but also to keep more people in the productive and moral private sector, which is ultimately better for societal prosperity. Promote nullification. Nullification simply means rejecting the legitimacy of a piece of legislation and therefore refusing to comply with it. Peaceful nullification can be pursued in two main ways in the U.S., by state governments and by jurors. I'll deal with each of these in turn. First, state governments can nullify federal legislation which they believe is unconstitutional based both on historical precedent and the structure of the Constitution. In general, this is implemented by passing state-level legislation to the effect that no state government personnel or resources will be permitted to assist the federal government in enforcing the relevant federal legislation within the state. This can be a very effective means of constraining the power of the federal government since it often relies, to a large extent, on the cooperation of the state governments. This has gained currency in recent times, as evidenced by various initiatives at the state level to restrict or negate such federal government programs as deporting illegal immigrants, spying on citizens by the National Security Agency, gun control, Obamacare, the war on drugs, and the Common Core education curriculum. <laughs> 
While the libertarian has no greater affinity for state governments than for federal government, the libertarian should support and encourage one arm of the state, broadly defined, taking on another arm if the net effect is to reduce the overall state activities. While state nullification is an effective way to oppose the federal government, it doesn't have any impact on the unjust activities of state governments. As a practical matter, it is, of course, entirely open for local governments to try to use the same strategy against state governments. However, as a matter of constitutional structure, local governments do not really have this option. Second, with respect to jurors, they can vote to acquit a defendant whom they believe is guilty of a crime where they believe that the crime itself is based on unjust legislation in the sense that the legislation is not legitimate pursuant to the NAP. For instance, even if the facts supported the case that the defendant had not paid his taxes, if a juror believes that taxes are an immoral act of robbery by the state, then he could vote to acquit that defendant and no court could question the juror's decision. The juror would not only be judging the facts, but also the legislation. This can be a powerful act of defiance against not just federal government legislation, but also state and local government legislation. It is one of the few times in which private citizens can have a meaningful, peaceful, oppositional impact. It could even impact the prospective decisions of law enforcement personnel who might decide in the face of continual jury nullification of certain victimless crimes to cease trying to enforce or prosecute them which might lead legislators to repeal such legislation. There is actually a history of impactful jury nullification in the U.S. In the mid-19th century, juries in northern states refused to convict under the Federal Fugitive Slave Act as an act of opposition to slavery, and in the early 20th century, juries refused to convict under the Federal Prohibition legislation. Today, there's a growing libertarian movement to make jurors more aware of the concept of jury nullification, despite the state's attempts to obfuscate this principle. More generally, nullification can be pursued more effectively as a societal strategy once enough people are educated in libertarian principles. At that time, each act of nullification would reinforce each other act and the groundswell of active opposition would become quite obvious to status. It would then become harder to argue that there is acquiescence to the state. Support non-state alternative products. There are situations in which the state has not yet fully prohibited citizens from using non-state alternatives to products that are provided, privileged, and or regulated by the state, Libertarians should try to use these alternative products where possible and encourage others to do the same. Examples of this include private mediation and arbitration services instead of the state's courts, private schools, homeschooling and online courses instead of state-provided schools, private residential communities instead of public towns and villages, private mail services such as FedEx, instead of the state's mail service, new transportation services such as Uber, and new accommodation services such as Airbnb instead of state-regulated taxi services and hotels, respectively, and alternative currencies such as Bitcoin, gold, or silver instead of state-mandated money. In addition, as there is increased traction around the world for special economic zones and seasteading, which are stateless or low-state communities carved from existing states, individuals and businesses could choose to relocate to these physical areas. Some of these are more expensive options, since A, the state can price its products without worrying about making a loss, and B, through taxes one is forced to pay for the state alternative, even if one chooses additionally to pay for the non-state alternative. However, to the extent that the libertarian can afford to choose these options, it would enhance the private sector's ability to compete with the state and withdraw some legitimacy from the state's claims that it must be a provider or regulator of these products.
using these options could be regarded as a partial secession from the authority of the state. Advocate for Secession Full-blown secession on the political level is the act of one political entity declaring its independence from another political entity. When one entity formerly governed by another secedes politically, it moves from being a subservient entity to a peer entity. In this way, the power of coercion is removed from that relationship and the two entities must now deal with each other in a state of political anarchy, i.e. on a purely voluntary basis. This can be one of the most dramatic yet peaceful ways for people in a given region to escape the power of larger state. Indeed, there is an elegance to secession as a solution to escaping an overlord entity. While land is fixed, jurisdictional boundaries are not. Secession doesn't involve moving the land, the citizen, or the overlord, but rather simply the boundaries of the prior overlord's rule. Secession also initiates a logic train that can lead to the dismemberment of political authority. If one region secedes from a larger entity, then that larger entity could not reasonably object when a second region seeks to secede, and a third region, etc., Similarly, if a region B secedes from a larger entity A, then region B could not reasonably object when a smaller region C seeks to secede from region B. If that happened, then, nor could region C reasonably object when a still smaller region D seeks to secede from region C. And if that also happened, then, nor could region D reasonably object when a still smaller unit a household seeks to secede. Accordingly, states have always vigorously fought secession attempts at any level because they understand where the logic train may end. Within the U.S., state-level secession has excellent historical and constitutional underpinnings. As a matter of history, in 1776, the original 13 American colonies seceded from Great Britain. And in 1781, these independent states formed a union under the Articles of Confederation. However, in 1788, a subset of these states seceded from this union and established a new union under the United States Constitution. Subsequently, all existing states joined this new union. Then, in 1861, a subset of these states seceded from the United States of America and formed the Confederate States of America under a separate constitution. There were also secession events within individual states. Kentucky seceded from Virginia, Tennessee from North Carolina, and Maine from Massachusetts. Turning to the constitutional perspective, it was the colonies, organized as states, that set up the federal government under the Constitution as their agent to carry out specific tasks. Just as with any principal-agent relationship, the principal, the states, can always fire the agent, the federal government, and withdraw from the relationship. Statists often claim that the American Civil War settled once and for all the question of whether there is a right to secede, but that is a specious argument because the outcome was based solely on violence. As libertarian historian Tom Woods likes to note, if a bully on the playground mugs another child and takes his lunch, then would anyone seriously conclude that the bully's right to that lunch is settled once and for all? Sure, he has the lunch now, but he got it illegitimately. However, the right to secede doesn't rest just on historical precedent and constitutional principles. There are strong moral and logical grounds, too. In terms of the moral grounds, if all men are metaphysically equal so that no man can rule another without his consent, then every man must be able to secede from any political authority once he withdraws his consent since that political authority is nothing more than a group of other men. In addition, since a state always acquires its property through coercion, such as through war, seizing private property owned by citizens, or physically claiming unowned property using income confiscated from citizens to fund its operations, 
none of this property is legitimately held by the state. Likewise, a state's control over citizens within its declared borders is based on coercion. Accordingly, the individuals at the state have no moral ground to object if citizens want to break away from the state's control and assert their right to reclaim or homestead state property. In terms of logic, to reject secession means to assert that a particular political entity, such as a nation-state, is the precise, God-given size that it needs to be, and it can absolutely not be one inch smaller. Of course, this makes no logical sense. Secession is also a concept much favored by libertarians because it reduces the size of states. Note that both the new state and the remaining rump state will individually be smaller than the previous combined state. For the libertarian, small is beautiful when it comes to states, or rather small is the least ugly form. The smaller the state, the less militarily powerful it is likely to be, in the sense that there are fewer human and other resources within its territory to commandeer, and thus the less able it would be to wage war on other states or act provocatively around the globe. This means that it is less likely that its citizens would suffer all the terrible consequences of war. We can see this principle in operation today whereby there are many small, relatively prosperous states which don't seek to exert any global power and which are left alone by the larger states, even though it would be relatively easy for the larger states to conquer them. Examples include Andorra, Costa Rica, which has no armed forces at all, Liechtenstein, ditto, Luxembourg, Monaco, and Singapore. Moreover, the smaller the state, the more intimate are the personal relationships between citizens and those at the state, and thus there is less that the individuals at the state can get away with. E.g., you can see your mayor at the local diner and complain to him that the garbage is not getting picked up on time, but it's a lot harder to have this conversation with your state governor or the president. In addition, each individual is more significant in a smaller state than in a larger state and thus there is less likely to be an emphasis by elected officials on mass marketing or sloganeering and more attention paid to individuals' concerns. Further, to the extent that there could be any commonality of interest among a group of people, whether in terms of culture, language, religion, or economics, it is much more likely to occur within a small village than within a county, state, or country e.g. the views on immigration in a small Texan village on the Mexican border, are likely to be more homogenous than the views of everyone in the U.S. Thus, it is more likely that a smaller state's actions would better reflect any shared interest of its citizens than would be the case with a larger state, where the interests are much more diverse. In addition, smaller states are at greater risk than larger states of losing their citizens to competing neighboring states, the smaller the state, the less costly it is for a citizen to move to a neighboring state in terms of distance from his family, employment, preferred culture, preferred climate, etc. Smaller states are also more sensitive than larger states to losing their citizens. With fewer resources to begin with, smaller states would feel the loss of any citizens and their financial capital more acutely than would larger states. Thus, smaller states must be much more careful than larger states about overreaching in their coercive actions against citizens. In addition to curtailing their coercive activities domestically, smaller states are also likely to prefer open, free trade across borders, both in terms of financial capital and goods. Since the smaller the state, the less self-sufficient it can be, and hence the more important imported financial capital and goods would be to the well-being of its population. Accordingly to the libertarian, a world with an increasing number of smaller and smaller states is a very positive trend. Thus, libertarians should be in favor of every secession movement, of which there is an increasing number these days. As the idea of secession gains currency, it is entirely possible that small libertarian communities would be able to break away and live on a purely voluntary basis. Engage in low-level civil resistance.
As large as the modern state is, it has simply passed too many regulations for it to effectively enforce them all against everyone. Much to their chagrin, but proving that scarcity is a fact, even for the state. The individuals at the state run up against the constraint that they have limited time and resources, and they have to allocate how they use them to selectively enforce regulations. This creates the opportunity for libertarians to simply ignore and ridicule the state's regulations when they are not aligned with the NAP. If this type of civil resistance grows over time, then it is possible that in certain areas the state might have to rethink whether its regulations make sense, given the obvious erosion of the public acquiescence which is necessary to sustain the state. Obviously, the degree of risk one is comfortable taking is up to the individual, but there are many lower risk ways to ignore the state's unjust rules. When practicable, transact using physical cash, gold, or anonymous cryptocurrencies to ensure transactions remain untrackable by the state. When turning 18 years of age, refuse to register with the Selective Service System. To avoid providing information helpful to the state if it decides to use military conscription to fight its wars. Employ and or provide sanctuary for illegal immigrants. If desired, consume alcohol and narcotics even if prohibited by legislation. Ignore occupational licensing regulations when running a small business. Refuse to recycle as commanded by the state. When appropriate, ignore speed limit legislation. Refuse to obtain the state's zoning approval when making small improvements to one's property, and support businesses which are obviously ignoring the most ridiculous state regulations. It's worth noting that a casual survey of society would show that many statists routinely act in these ways, and what is most amusing and revealing, this includes many individuals who work for the state itself. Oftentimes, the retort from statists who are caught in the act is, but I wasn't hurting anyone. Exactly. Perhaps it is innate in all humans to judge rules by the standard of the NAP, even if not everyone can articulate this as clearly as libertarians can.